Coming up next, an interview with one of the most underrated singers of his time. He has a phenomenal voice. Man, one of the best of his time for sure. He fronted a band that killed it on the other side of the Atlantic while making some inroads here in the States in the mid 80s. But then at the turn of that decade, they blew up the charts with a heart-wrenching vocal performance on a song that came from the biggest movie of that year. And to think that the song really came from a random comment that they heard at a bar. Second he wrote down the song, I mean the moment he put down his pen, he knew it was gonna be a smash hit. And then they immediately had another huge hit. Then they never touched the charts ever again. This is one you gotta see very interesting. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever been so blown away by a song that you heard in a movie that you immediately went and bought the soundtrack, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below and uh, you know, click the, the little box there so that you always get our latest interviews. We have some amazing ones coming. I remember that so many times I'd see a great movie and I'd go right out and buy the soundtrack. So make sure to check out our Patreon. The link is below. We've got a new series starting there and you're going to really like it. So it's time for another episode of our series, Revelations, my favorite. This is where artists and bands give us unique insight into uh, their greatest songs and their greatest albums. And today, we have a rare sit down with one of the most underappreciated singers of the 80s and 90s, Mr. Peter Cox from the band Go West. Now, Go West had several hits in the 80s, and then they hit a, a, a patch of bad luck with no label support and a, a changing of the guard at the top of the food chain, if you will. Uh, they were able to do some writing with the number one hit songwriter, Martin Page. The duo of Go West consisted of Peter Cox and Richard Drummy, and combined with Martin Page, they created the hit to Faithful. That went to number 14 in 1992. And of course, their signature song, King of Wishful Thinking. That hit number eight in 1990 off the Pretty Woman soundtrack. The way that this song came about and how they were able to get uh, in on the, the blockbuster film of 1990, which was really a Cinderella story itself, it just seems too good to be true. But yes, it is true. Here's Peter Cox with the story of the King of Wishful Thinking. One of my favorite songs of all time, King of Wishful Thinking. A song that Richard wrote with, as we've talked about, prolific songwriter Martin Page. How did you guys connect? Uh, after the second, the difficult second album, uh, a new a and department arrived in the UK, and I should have mentioned by now, Ron Fair, I don't know if that name is familiar to you, but he's, he's you know, signed the Black Eyed Peas, Christina Aguilera, any number of hugely successful artists. And it was through Ron that we initially got our deal with Chrysalis. Um, and once the second album had obviously underperformed, to say the very least, um, blessing Ron was effectively, he wasn't fired, but he was demoted so far that he really had no option but to leave and move on to another label, which he did. So we had a standoff with the A&R department in the UK. I chose this moment, much to everyone's dismay, to, to tell the A&R guy what I thought about the records that he had been involved in up until then, which he didn't take kindly to, unsurprisingly, and basically said, I have the checkbook and until you do what I say, there won't be any more money. So we went home and sat there for months, finally in an attempt to get things moving. So uh, Richard was sent to, the, to New York to work on the writer's circuit there. And I was sent to California, which suits me because I like <laughs> California. Yeah. I came out to California and I worked with a number of people. The collaborations were more or less successful. And then one day I showed up at Martin Page's house and Martin was the one writer that I worked with on that trip that seemed to have put some thought into where we were coming from as a band. And so the first thing he presented me with sounded to me like something that we might have written. So that was a song called That's What Love Can Do. And somewhere in that process, Ron, now at EMI America, realizing that he hadn't heard anything from us for some time, 
called and said, where's the next Go West album, guys? What's going on? In six weeks, we were off Christmas, signed to EMI America, and we were in California. Uh, you know, Ron was just amazing at making things happen, but he salvaged us from a difficult situation. You know, we were at the aforementioned Le Parc Hotel, where we spent many, many weeks in our attempt to break into the American market. And we were in the bar, unsurprisingly, having a drink in the bar and discussing where we were. And Richard said, yeah, we'll be fine with the Kings of Wishful Thinking. And I just thought, oh, that's a good, that, that'd be a good song title. And so when we got together with Martin, I put that forward as the title. So that's how the collaboration came about in the first place. Yeah. I read that you really wanted to give them a hit. You really wanted to work to give them something incredible. And that's really a modern day Motown song. Oh, you just nailed it. it, it I, just, I feel that too. Yeah. It's a Smokey Robinson song yeah. in a way. Yeah. It could have been a Motown. I say, I really feel, I said it to a few friends. I said, King of Wish would think it could stand the test of time as a really good Motown, Smokey Robinson kind of song because it's got that blue lyric, but where, where it really takes you straight away into a great groove. It's bouncy. It's just like this bouncy, happy song, right? But dramatic, and it's kind of disguised. And that's what makes it so gut-wrenching, is that the further you get into the song, the more that mask kind of comes off. And it's just a flawless vocal performance. But tell me about writing it. What inspired it? It was just, again, brainstorming in the room. But I do remember singing, I'll get over you. And then Richard straight in with the background vocals. So that has made performing that song quite challenging because in the studio, I sang the whole melody line, including Richard's BB. And of course, I suppose in that moment of time, when I sang that phrase, I thought there'd be a, a pause after that where I'd be able to take a lungful of air. And then Richard comes in with the BB. So now the, the melody line is, is more continuous in the chorus. I think Martin was quite, in a collaboration, I think he's savvy in that he understands that the, the lyric has to sound right coming out of the singer's mouth. It's got to sound genuine. It's got to sound honest. And so while he might say, that's cool, he wouldn't necessarily be trying to force any ideas, certainly on me as a singer. The first part where it says, I don't need to fall at your feet just because you cut me to the bone. <laughs> I mean, just a great lyric. I don't miss the way that you kissed me. We were never carved in stone. We were never carved in stone. Just poetry. Oh, man, thanks very much. <laughs> what do you Appreciate remember that. about those lines? Just kind of come yeah, out? Yeah, all my idea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. I, I, don't, I don't remember specifically. But, you know, the thing is, again, as I say, about being the singer, uh, I would argue that the more it's coming from the singer, the more, in my own case, the more I can sing a song with conviction. You know, that's, I, can, I kind of think that's what it's about. I don't need to fall at your feet. Well, and if I don't listen to the talk of the town, then maybe I can fool myself. And the part where you say, where you go into the chorus because I'm the king of wishful thinking. I love how you come in and repeat the line. You do that, the little ooh part right there. I am the king of wish that just felt like it was you in the moment. Is that what it kind of was in the recording studio? Because some things just aren't planned. I think that that just shows so much vulnerability. I'm not sure that it was so much of a conscious effort to create that feeling in the listener. But I can remember that Arrangement-wise, those extra two bars there where the title is repeated, I do remember that that was Martin's idea. He thought, we need to make sure that people have the title. Let's just give it to them one more time, as it were. I am a king, I wish for yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And then, I refuse to give in to my blues. That's not how it's going to be. 
that harmony, I love how you go into the harmony parts in that second verse because it builds the song. That's not how it's gonna be. That mantra of, a, okay, we have verse one. How is verse two gonna be different from verse one? What's gonna happen? We need an event, we need a keyboard part, we need a harmony, so on and so on. So yeah, I would say that was song craft, songwriting craft in a way. Yeah, just to, to add that harmony there. Well, and it's just the little uh, nuances, vocal nuances, like when you say, because I don't want to let you see, no, that whole part. No. That you have made a hole in my heart. I mean, it's just, man, it's gut-wrenching. Thanks, man. Those nuances were just great. Thank you. Those little inflections like the, the falsetto part that you go into, and then there's the sax part. You kind of come back in because there's that break. And then I'll never, never shed a tear for you. Again, these are things that just take the song from a 10 to an 11. These little nuances. Thanks, man. I mean, I, I would definitely say that uh, in the songwriting process, hopefully you've got your, your verse lyric, your chorus lyric, you've got the melody. Uh, it's almost that one of the trickiest parts as the singer is when you get to the outro and you're singing that first outro chorus and then everyone's going, okay, we've heard that, now what are you gonna do? And then it's you kind of in front of the microphone in the studio and you have to make something happen. And that I would say isn't necessarily something that I would work out. I didn't work out those parts in The King of Wishful Thinking because I remember being in the studio and we had been working on that song, we recorded it Twice before, we recorded it with Wendy and Lisa producing. And uh, so clearly the label felt that the song was strong because they kept on making recording funds available to go back in the studio to get the song right. And we were working with uh, Peter Wolf, the Austrian producer, and I'm in front of the mic trying to do the lead vocal and clearly not, not delivering what Peter Wolf wanted to hear. He, didn't, he wasn't hearing the angst or, or the... Or the the particular feeling, maybe the one that you're talking about. So we're going over it and going over it. And I think there's an element of desperation, not necessarily coming from an emotional standpoint, <laughs> but just like, I need to, I've I got I to gotta come up with something good here. You know, and um, what you hear is what you got. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you thought it was good. <laughs> and then that last pre-chorus, when the music goes a little bit quiet, and then you sing, I'll get over you, I'll pretend my ship's not sinking. That yeah. Yeah. that just brings it all together at the end there. I'll pretend my ship's not sinking. That's brilliant. It's one of those, like I said, hair-raising experiences as a listener. And then when on the end where you just go off, I'll pretend that my heart's still beating. And that's where, and again, I know that it wasn't so planned, but that's where the mask totally comes off and it's like, all right, I really am struggling here. This is a massive heartbreak. And that's what's great about the song is because it holds that pride. And then it just, as the song goes along, you kind of fall apart at the end. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I should give Peter Wolf more credit as if he, I mean, obviously he produced the track. We, we worked, we did a whole album with Peter, but you know, maybe there's, subtlety in production going on there while I'm in the studio in front of the microphone and Pete's going, come on, come on, you know, we need more, we need more. And I remember, because my voice cracks a little bit, it's not perfect in that particular breakdown that you mentioned there. Tried to do a thing and something happened, obviously, but it, maybe it wasn't exactly what I, what I would have dreamt would happen. And when the tape stopped rolling, I can remember, I can hear Peter Wall saying, yes, that's the you know, so, <laughs> so he was pleased. He was pleased. I love that. Well, you mentioned that the little part where your voice cracks, and I really feel like that's what's missing from modern music because people have perfected things so much where you've got auto-tune and they want it to sound so perfect. We're missing that. When the voice cracks, those little imperfections are what makes these records from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, great, and the 90s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's human. Pretty Woman, a lot of people don't realize that 
King of Wishful Thinking wasn't written for the movie. It was written before that. And tell us how that came about, because I know that it had something to do with EMI having the soundtrack and everything. But tell us about the process of getting of them coming to you and having that on the on the soundtrack and the movie. We wrote the King of Wishful Thinking, and again, it's the difference in our personalities. Because Richard was like, "Well, that's a hit." And I said, do you think so? Because I, I, I don't know. I don't think there are any guarantees. I'm always a little bit uh, less sure. But Richard was like, no, that's, that is a stone cold hit single. Played it to the label. They agreed, obviously. And uh, a touchstone, I think, is the film company that made Pretty Woman. And they had obviously contacted EMI America saying, look, we're looking for a soundtrack for this movie. And so, because... EMI America obviously thought The King of Wishful Thinking was a hit. They said, well, we need to put this on the record. So it was really a question of, as I've said many times, being in the right place at the right time. I think that a lot of that happens in the music industry, things that you don't plan for. And then we just got lucky, basically. We were so happy to be number eight. We were so happy to finally have an American hit after years and years of trying. Your single and rock set, It Must Have Been Love, two big hits that drove that to being a huge soundtrack for 1990, sold three or four million copies in the U.S. alone. And yeah. uh, you guys were nominated for a, a 1991 Brit Award for Best British Video. And did you see the film when it came out? We were invited to go up into town to watch the way they had put the song into the film. Here we are at the beginning of the film, there's no dialogue when Richard Gere drives down the, the hills in his borrowed car. There's no dialogue. You get to hear the whole verse and the whole chorus of the song, which in my experience, that's the only time that's ever happened to us where you <laughs> actually got an opportunity to tune in. It's right at the beginning of the film. Everyone's paying attention. You get to hear the verse and the chorus. I don't need to fall at your feet. But because of the way they alter the audio. My voice was early against the music, a couple of frames early or something. I was so angry about it. If I don't listen to the talk of the town. But anyway, it all turned out in the wash, I guess. I think it's one of those songs for sure that just like We Close Our Eyes is where you can play that song and it immediately takes the listener to that moment in their life. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, people say that in general about coming to see the band play live. I mean, we always have prided ourselves in having the best players around us that we can. I am a king of it's my opinion that when you're playing people's songs, uh, you hope that if they're coming to hear that record that they love, that they will be in the moment and think, wow, it's, you know, that's the song I was doing this at that time. They associate those songs with, with hopefully uh, a good time and a good memory. So I'm glad that uh, it has that effect. Here's a rundown of their hits. Go West barely missed the top 40 with their 1985 hit. It was huge on the other side of the Atlantic. We close our eyes. That hit number 41. Then they had their first hit with a sequel to a song called Don't Look Down, the sequel at number 39. Then they hit number eight with The King of Wishful Thinking in 1990. And then number 14 with Faithful in 1993. And then they were gone. They never had another hit. It's crazy. Hey, leave us a comment about this all-time movie soundtrack fixture. This song is such an incredible song. What are your memories of this spectacular song? I remember I was heartbroken over a girl. I, I listen to this song all the time. What's your story? Tell us below. If you like our videos, make sure that you subscribe below and hit the bell. That way you never miss out on our new interviews. Our, our, we're a daily channel again, so there's always going to be something good coming your way. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.